one of the most exciting of these finds was the discovery of Griffith's first picture. Notes accompanying this footage tell us that in May 1908, Griffith learned that a noted German director, Wolfgang von Amberg and his crew were coming to this country to make a picture. Griffith borrowed a camera, joined them on location, and shot this footage. Here we see Van Amberg rehearsing his actors while his technicians prepare the equipment. Van Amberg's highly capable cameraman contributed much to these early scenes. German director's dissatisfaction with the fixed camera resulted in a stroke of genius, the first dolly shot. Oh, I remember one semester, we, we didn't have much money, and so we said to 480, you have a theme, and the theme was Bicycle Thief. So they all had to make a film on the yeah. Bicycle Thief. El diadema, grazie. Ti rendi grazie. Ma perché taci tu? Guarda, sono i figli tuoi. Sul ciglio mio il pianto al fin tornò. Oh, figli miei, oh, figli miei, io vamo tanto a miei tesori. Ancora li stringo a me, non penso più al duol che mardi in petto. Ahimè, quale tormento il cuore di madre batte nel mio petto. C'è so del cor la guerra. Bob Hall came from education. He really wasn't uh, from film. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah and I one. remember there was a big to-do that some of us really wondered why in the world we were getting somebody from education. And then we had Jim Finn, who was more educated yeah. for a little while. That's how Bernie got in. Well, Jim and Bernie tied yeah. together for a while. Bernie was taking his degree with Jim, and uh, he, so he came in as his on-the-spot man. We all admired Bernie for his abilities, and... He was a, a really the spark plug of the, of the organization, held us together, fought for us. Mr. Edwin Scheller. Uh, other people who spoke were Douglas Fairbanks, <clears throat> uh, J. Stuart Blackton, Ernst Lubitsch, Irving Thalberg, many more. This became the start of the cinema department. Uh, since then, with your help, we've grown. We he was a co-chairman for a while, but then he took over full-fledged duties until he had his heart attack. With an emphasis in cinema. So, for all your help, we thank you. Bernie was a dreamer. Well, he wasn't only a dreamer, but he, he was a builder as well. Yeah, one of the things he did is that he made us aware of where we were in the university. He made us think and be bigger than where we were. That's right. And to him, we were more than just a division in the performing arts. He, he figured we could stand alone, be a separate school. Yeah, and he tried to do something about it. You mean getting the funding for Norris Theater, things like that? Yeah, and then don't forget there was the annex and uh, television. Ah, <laughs> television. I recall only too well when we converted that old store into a television studio. That's when Mort Zarkoff and Trevor Greenwood came, wasn't it? Yeah, it was about the same time that Gene Coe came on that uh, Bernie had found him to take over the graphics program. But you have to remember, Bernie really enjoyed teaching. Yeah, Bernie did want to teach, and uh, so he brought in Ross McGregor and started grooming him in the office. To... That's right, and then after Bernie had his fatal heart attack, the faculty all got together with the 
then dean of School of Performing Arts, and we all thought it would be a good idea if uh, Russ and Mort kind of shared the co-chairmanship. They started as co-chairman, and the faculty was very heavily involved. We used to have all those brown bag lunches, and that's where we would meet and discuss the policy and the whole curriculum. It was really as if we were all a part of this thing. And through it all, we kept hearing about all these new buildings we were going to have. And how many plans did we look at? Oh, there must have been thousands. Russ took over, and as we grew, he, he steered us toward uh, two things in particular. Perhaps the most important, how do we pay for it? The dollars to build the new facility. And also, he was working very hard to get us established as a school. He wanted us to be the first school of cinema television. Well, I, I'm kind of a child of the late 50s rather than a, a 60s kid. And uh, um, I think that when I got interested in making movies, it went through my brain like a silver bullet about halfway through undergraduate school, that um, that would be a good thing to do. And I was very interested in animation. That's what I wanted to study. And those are the kind of movies that I wanted to make. It's about a little animated bug that takes over the world briefly. We made it right out in front of the old cinema department. It was a thrill to come here and find yourself surrounded by virtually everybody, all of whom wildly interested in film. Matthew Robbins and Walter Murch and George Lucas and Bob Dalva and all my friends that went through film school with me. And we when that sort of group that came through sort of suddenly realized that theatrical motion pictures were going to be terrific and wonderful things to do. I came to California in 1965. I had graduated from Johns Hopkins with a BA in Romance Languages. And I got interested in movies while I was studying in Paris. I came back to this country and I figured that the best thing to do would be go, to go to film school. And I wound up at USC with Walter Murch, actually, who was my roommate at Johns Hopkins. And the cinema department was uh, comforting and unprepossessing. I liked that very much. It was a little wooden shack, famous to us. What it turned out to be was a maze. It was a game. The winners were the ones who figured out that it was a process of making movies. The, the biggest problem you have going to film school is you get, the day you get there, you want to start making movies. And somebody has to explain to you that you just you have to slow down a little bit and learn the basics before you can get get to that level, yeah. And it's necessary to do that. It's not an easy job. Uh, things were organized so that from time to time you would get to make a movie. But the object really was to make um, as many movies as possible in a class or not. And there wasn't any kind of uh, feelings one way or the other, any kind of judgments made about what kind of movies people wanted to make. And there were people there, you know, uh, it's ironic that one of the biggest students who had the biggest problem there was in doing uh, Republic serials and comic book characters. And, you know, wanted to make Batman and things like that. And, you know, <laughs> and that was considered uh, not acceptable at the time. Uh, where now it's perfectly socially acceptable to be doing those kinds of movies, I guess. <laughs>
He was teaching in the graphics area. And so there were a lot of crazy films uh, that were undertaken in the graphics area. I was only taking one production class, and that was animation from Herb Kostauer. And uh, in that class, Everybody was sort of you know, giving uh, 32 feet of film and say, here, do a test. So uh, instead of doing the test, I made a movie because I was just real enthralled with the whole idea. Made a movie, put a soundtrack on it, and it won a lot of film festivals. And from that point on, I sort of took off. I just was um, interested in George. He was a skinny little kid who came in and took a lot of clippings from Life magazine and made them into this wonderful animated movie. And, and I just thought, boy, this is terrific. Now, he was the best filmmaker in the department. Uh, he looked pretty funny. He had these uh, kind of aquamarine sports jackets with little aluminum thread running through them. He, <laughs> he looked like Buddy Holly, about 98 pounds. He made films, uh, no matter what he made, it was always highly finished and highly um, organized visually. I remember we were most inspired by the Canadian Film Board when I was there. That was the main inspiration, because that, at that period of time, the Canadian Film Board was really hot. Feeling big never feels bad. Money, pictures, and sex, it's just kind of the same. It's interchangeable. Sometimes I don't know whether it's sex and pictures that I'm working on or pictures and sex. And I, you know, I just really don't know, like, man, you know. Well, even you, you've got an interchangeable medium, you know, or commodity. Oh, that's Marcello I'm so bored. That was made by crazy John Milius. Milius was also very much as he is today, which is he was, uh, challenged Herb Kassauer to a gunfight in the patio of the department once. He was, uh, not entirely welcome in that era. He, uh, this is the late 60s, uh, Vietnam, all that goes with it. John, with his uh, flamboyant right-wing views, was uh, the object of much uh, what? controversy. He, was, uh, he, he enjoyed stirring it up. Everybody was under the gun in terms of if you lost your student deferment, you were shipped off. And um, I don't think there were very many of us that were really enthusiastic about that idea. Uh, and as um, graduation got closer, and we, you know, it looked like we were going to end up getting drafted, uh, I know there was a, a lot of concern about what, you know, what you do in that situation. Then again, we had lots of people in the department who were um, from the uh, services. We had uh, a lot of Air Force people. And I thought, well, these look like good guys. Maybe <laughs> I could go into the... Air Force and make movies. I remember George and I used to talk about that. He was going to enlist. All the draft dodgers yeah. came who came to stay out of the draft, and movie making was neat. Yeah. And they had, to, you know, they never expected anything out of it. They just wanted to stay out of the draft. And after the war was over, they'd go on to whatever they had planned to do. But unfortunately, or fortunately, however you look <laughs> at it, uh, they got hooked on movies.
terrible time. Nobody could really understand why we were involved in Vietnam. Nobody wanted to be involved in Vietnam. We were told we weren't at war, yet people were being killed, and nobody could understand that. I think that the Vietnam War caused a lot of maturation. And certainly the events at that time were not something that that generation could ignore because maybe it was going to affect their own lives. So I think the times had a lot to do with it. We found ourselves with a lot of very, very intelligent, a lot of very, very creative people here at that time in the student body. They were essentially trying to deal with the, the straitjacket they felt was waiting right outside the door for their life. There was... Uh you know, a lot of disillusionment with the government, a lot of disillusionment with what was going on, and then a lot of pressure because we were under the gun. I mean, there's nothing like uh, the threat of being sent off to war, especially a war you don't believe in, to uh, give you a certain mindset. We're looking at TNT for you. Hey, uh, have you been programmed before? class I ever had, Gene Peterson stood up there and with his shirt unbuttoned down to his waist and a cigarette clenched in his teeth, and he said, you guys, what are you doing here? Get out of here. You can't get work in this business. Forget it. Go home. Go be a dentist. How about all of it? He was, was an individual. Great yeah. Wall City of Zan and yeah, that's uh, Hal Cosmos Darwin. and that whole... He, in fact, he, he did uh, Zan as a 505, but it was hmm. really a uh, graphic film. I mean, it was just step away and, and let him go. What are you gonna yes, he was really had his do? own view of the world. Hal Barwood was uh, the star of the animation department. He made uh, The Great Walled City of Zan and Child's Introduction to the Cosmos, two USC cinema classics. <laughs> He was one of the brightest students I think we ever had. Yeah. The only guy ever sent me to a dictionary to look up the words in his paper, you know, and then they were all used correctly. He was Herb Kossauer's TA, and he did a couple of productions, and he did one in 505 that I coordinated with Herb. I think that was the Great Wall City of Zan. And then when Herb got sick, Hal took over his classes and finally substituted for him until Gene Coe was located and Bernie managed to convince him to come on to head that particular program. That was, the, that was when we started going Hollywood, Passing Lane. I uh, 
made that film, I started getting interested in telling stories about that time. This is the era when UCLA, the crosstown rival, stood for the social conscience and the marijuana and the loose structure and the let it all hang out in black and white soft focus and terrible sound. And USC was known chiefly through films, uh, this sort of soulless, empty, glossy, wonderful uh, product with a capital T. shot on the freeways around town. In fact, there's um, an overpass in downtown LA which has some of the graffiti that Walter and I sprayed on the uprights down there as part of the set dressing. Well, we had a skull that we did at three in the morning and uh, you can just see the top of the skull with some shock lines radiating from it. It was 1972. I'd done all the trendy things of the 1960s. I was living in a commune in Western Massachusetts, trying to be a farmer and discussing women's issues. So I was apprehensive about coming to Los Angeles. At the time, I think the rest of the country felt that LA was the land of the Philistines. Um, and I expected to really hate the place. Um, and that USC was a very straight organization. And I expected to not fit in here either. So when I finally got to the cinema department and found in this sea of sort of tall, you know, very Sort of elegant and imposing buildings, this little shack, it was, uh, it was wonderful. And I showed up with my van and my three dogs, and I walked into Bernie Canner's office, and I said, I'm here, can I start now? I really don't want to wait. And he said, oh, well, okay, we'll work that out. I did two 16 millimeter sync sound films while I was here. Um, one turned out quite well. It was about a small, cohesive community fighting for its existence in the face of development. But canals do something to people because there's something about the daily life and it sort of gets communicated and the daily life itself changes people. You know, people stop rushing around so much, you know, they lay back. A lot of people get more work done than they ever did. A lot of people just stop doing the work that they used to do compulsively. But all of our doors are open. My kids uh, could go into anybody's house practically any time and be fed and taken care of. And the whole feeling is that there's a lot more being given and shared. We would go out with the equipment and sort of hope that something exciting would happen. Uh, we would film things and then not know if we had anything or not until we got back. There were, we were trying on the, this film about the Venice Canals, the small community, to do a collective directing. Sure. I mean, we all, we called all of ourselves the directors. So we had hours and hours and hours of conversation inside someone's living room with the equipment sort of scattered in the middle of us, not doing anything except having conversations. A lot of us feel that living in the city is an alienating experience. The kind of alienation I'm talking about is the alienation where you have people living in their separate little boxes side by side, where there's no neighborhood life, where there's no street life. I remember seeing some of the, the older films, people who had gone through maybe a year or two ahead of me. I remembered The List, that was a very frightening film about an elevator in this grand old building, and it was dark and creaky and really quite wonderful. was a film about a car wash, which was kind of interesting. <laughs> the 
people did thrillers. You could do anything, and people did. They did anything and everything. There was a controversy when I first arrived at school over a, a film that had been a 480, a sink sound, 16 millimeter film called Field of Honor, um, which had been very well received and was really quite controversial. It was made by Bob Gale and uh, Robert Zemeckis. Um, and I think it had a very funny but very violent tone to it. A lot of people were objecting to. Stinking human trash. Don't come back to me, you low-lying, lily-livered, yellow-bellied scum. Come on, come on, get up and fight, you slimy coward. Nobody move. I'm taking this bus to Cuba. Drop that gun. The FBI. But it was shown to us a lot, and we looked at it and, and talked about it and talked about the responsibility of filmmaking and filmmakers. Um, they were excited.